Fields Institute. Uh, this is uh, it's time for us to start, so we'll, we'll get going. Um, it's uh, my pleasure to welcome you here to the 15th annual Kikits Lecture in Mathematics and Social Sciences. And as we begin, I would like to acknowledge that we are the Fields Institute is located on the traditional lands of the Huron Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit River. And uh, we acknowledge and are grateful for the opportunity to work on, on, on this land here. So the Keefitz Lecture was uh, started, first held in 2007. Uh, it's a, supported by an endowed gift from Nathan and Beatrice Keefitz, who uh, were gave the, the, the money for, to, to create this lecture while their daughter, Barbara Keefitz, was the director of the Fields Institute. So it's a sign that who you know matters a lot, <laughs> and it's really good to have connections and to have family who are interested in and engaged in the work that, uh, that we're all doing. So it's really, I think it's a very positive sign that, that yeah, just really very nice to, to feel that this was something that they wanted to do and, and an occasion to, to create something which is brings both the mathematics and the social sciences together. And it's a piece of the work that we are continuing to do and, and want to do. A uh, sign of one of the things that we've been doing in the last couple of years has been the uh, Math for Public Health program that, we, that was started. And going forward, we're uh, thinking about Math for Climate Change as well. So we see all of this as coming together as being part of what the Field Institute can do uh, with mathematics in the world. So for today's lecture, we're very pleased to have uh, Dr. Sharmista Mishra. Uh, Dr. Mishra is the Canada Research Chair in Mathematical Modeling uh, and Program Science in the University of Toronto Department of Medicine and the Institute of Health Policy Management and Evaluation. She has an MD from the University of Toronto and a PhD from uh, Imperial College of the University of London and um, many more degrees and accolades that I didn't write down and I'm not going to go through. <laughs> so she's telling us today about the very interesting and provocative title, Mathematical Modeling of Epidemics. Are we confronting or amplifying health inequalities? Dr. Bishop. Thank you so much. And uh, thanks for having me here. It's a, it's a real honor to have an opportunity to speak at this, um, this lecture. Um, in part because I am neither a mathematician nor am I a social scientist. So um, I appreciate this opportunity to bring the perspectives and the work that we've been doing that tries to cut across a couple of different, couple of different fields. So the perspective I bring and, and to think about the land that I both now inhabit and, and work on, um, I'm coming at this from the perspective of South Asian immigrant settler uh, living on unceded traditional lands of many nations. Um, and in particular covered by Treaty 13. Um, and, and as we talk through today's presentation, I'd like to reflect a little bit on constructs and concepts around thinking about relations, thinking about um, governance, thinking also about the concept of non-interference and how we actually have coined that term and reflected and used it in the context of epidemiology and epidemics. So as as far as today goes, what I'm hoping to touch upon are frameworks of health equity, insights from modeling or mathematical modeling of epidemics and thinking about how the two might be integrated, um, trying to challenge some assumptions, some fallacies, and some work that has gone on in the fields of HIV, some work in COVID, uh, I won't have time to touch upon MPOX and others, that maybe challenge um, and bring some logic to these fallacies to kind of question our use and misinterpretation or, or misconstruction of equity. And then finally land upon some questions for us and, and positioning the role of mathematical modeling in either amplifying or working towards reducing inequities and in epidemics. So first some just background framing and, and placing ourselves in the constructs and in the frameworks of health equity. So health inequalities they're observed differences. They're just an observation. It's a dimension. It's just a measure of health of individuals and, and groups. When we, they don't 
attribute or ascribe any value or any judgment to what might actually be causing those inequalities. When we do that, we then talk about health inequities. Inequalities, those that we, the things that we're measuring, the distributions we're measuring, that are unjust, they're avoidable, they're preventable, they're modifiable. And these preventable differences in health outcomes are closely linked to social, economic, and environmental conditions. So I'm not talking about often individual level factors here, we're talking about things that occur at a structural level. And one important quote that sort of speaks to this, and I think has been at the heart of a lot of people working in the field of HIV modeling and also COVID and other infectious diseases, is that when we think about health inequities, we're talking about the following. Quote, by one common definition, when health differences are preventable and unnecessary, allowing them to persist is unjust. And that's where we're sort of framing our work moving forward. So what does that mean for those of us working in the field of infectious diseases? So when we talk about inequalities in epidemics, the most common term, and, and for those of you, and I apologize for those of you who've heard parts of my talk before, we're talking about heterogeneity. That's the language that we use in epidemiology, in mathematics. We sort of talk about observed differences and distributions again, but now we're talking about differences and distributions in cases, in, in sort of who acquires infection. When we're thinking about inequities in epidemics, we're then taking those inequalities, and now we're saying, which, what inequalities stem from, and this is the key word, mechanisms that are unjust and preventable or modifiable. And these mechanisms are where I think, as epidemic modelers, we have a major role to play. So there are many frameworks of health equity, but there are common factor to all of them, and particularly in the many last recent years, is to center population outcomes rather than thinking about just individual outcomes when we think about health equity. We're talking about access, we're talking about resources and opportunities at the, for communities, not just at an individual level. And we're talking about all of the factors, these ideas of these spheres of influence, including systems of power that are obstructing, that create institutionalized systems that prevent access, opportunities, resources. And so when we think about this, it's starting to kind of really take a shape, take a frame of multi-level modeling. It's starting to take this shape of factors that are not specifically just at the individual level. And what's interesting is that as health equity frameworks have been not only developed, but consolidated, so have frameworks in infectious disease epidemics, but largely in the setting of HIV. So I've seen it less so in, the cons in, in, in other infectious diseases, but in HIV and other sexually transmitted infections, there's been a large amount of work done on theoretical and conceptual frameworks that have gone beyond sort of just looking at the individual level or even just at the network level, but starting to look at and think about policies, systems of power, system institutionalized factors. For example, thinking about in the context of key affected populations, the criminalization of same-sex behavior in particular countries that lead to disproportionate risks of infectious disease or HIV transmission in this case. So we have a, several frameworks for health equity. We have several frameworks and theoretical constructs for infectious disease epidemics, particularly with HIV. And the work now is to try to figure out how to bring those together. And people have been trying to do that, but again, particularly in the field of HIV. So then I, as you bring these pieces together, as we bring in health equity frameworks and these concepts and theoretical frameworks for infectious disease epidemics, I wanted to come back to that idea of inequities and talk about mechanisms. As mathematical modelers, this is our bread and butter. This is what we're doing. We're actually directly creating causal frameworks every time we build a dynamical systems model. We are ascribing cause and effect here in a simple SIR system, ascribing contacts and changing contacts, creating counterfactuals, and then saying this is the cause and this is the effect. Changing in contacts leads to changes in the epidemic dynamics. So if our job day to day is mechanistic, then the next question becomes, what, is, what are those mechanisms that help us understand and therefore study inequities? 
Well, they're going to be mechanisms of heterogeneity. These mechanisms of heterogeneity can play out at the level of exposure. And here we're talking about disproportionate or differential exposure to infection, either risks or resilience. Then we're talking about, I'm going to skip over the middle one, to severity. So often we're talking about if infected, who is more likely, what are the conditions that lead to more severe infection or disease from that particular pathogen that might be biological, for example, age, but it also may also reflect structural elements, including things like access to care services, the type and the quality of care we get that can be shaped by multiple structural factors. But the part that where modelers can really play a role is in the middle, onward transmission. That's specific and unique to infectious disease dynamics. Well, not necessarily. You can say a lot of other things can also be um, you know, transmitted. But if we're thinking about infectious disease dynamics, we're really talking about differential or disproportionate onward transmission, risks and or resilience. And so what are the modifiable mechanisms, therefore, that lead to disproportionate risks of onward transmission? And when we think about networks, when we think about them, whether at a network individual level, whether we start kind of compartmentalizing them and thinking about you know, core networks and sort of peripheral networks and how infectious diseases might saturate and or pass between networks, however we might think about them, the idea of embedding the work of inequities is really thinking about what are the systems of power, relationships, whether individual factors, physiological, intergenerational trauma that can shape these networks that can shape disproportionate risks within networks, including things such as shared access to care or barriers to shared access to care. And so we're thinking of that as epidemic modelers, and now we put on our hat as epidemiologists. And what do epidemiologists do? Well, they look at things like causal frameworks. So when we take a look and think about cause and effect, we're really studying things like, hey, if there's an exposure, if we're trying to study the relationship or the, ideally the causal mechanism from lower income households who may experience increased risk of COVID, what mediates that? What, is, what are the factors that would be within M? Perhaps it's household crowding, perhaps it's occupational um, with respect to uh, essential workers and frontline services. What might be confounders not affected by the exposure, things like age or biological sex? What may be confounders, L, but affected by the exposure? Perhaps it's also access to vaccination and other elements. So these causal diagrams and these causal frameworks, and this is um, uh, a shout out to work by Lin Wei Wang on our team who does a lot of this, thinking about it from an epidemiological perspective, now thinking how can we embed that when we think about our transmission dynamics models? Because what we can do, with, what we want to do with causal frameworks is develop counterfactuals, our what if experiments. If we do X, what would happen? Not relationships, but cause and effect. And that's where, again, our simulation modeling, our mathematical modeling can play a really important role. Because the way we measure inequalities is pretty typical. We measure absolute difference. We measure relative difference borrowing from the world of economists who have studied inequality and income distribution we can measure things like the lorenz curve how far we are from proportionality or equality and measure things like the gini coefficient sort of the area between the two the hoover index there's several indices that kind of give us this idea of distribution of a given outcome and in this case for infectious diseases we're talking about distribution of cases or, or acquisition. But what none of these tell us, well, actually I'll come to that part. So the other part about distribution of cases that we love in epidemiology is the population attributable fraction. So similar to how we looked at the distribution of the cases using, for example, our Lorenz curve or Gini coefficient, we'd like to measure in epidemiology the fraction by which the occurrence of a disease of interest would be reduced under an alternate exposure de definition, a distribution, or the counterfactual. And here, again, we're speaking back to the importance of counterfactuals in the study of epidemiology. 
But most of our cohort studies, they don't do this. Most of the observational epidemiological studies, except for perhaps randomized controlled trials, don't actually give us a counterfactual. And so we're measuring things like risk difference and absolute difference and the distribution of cases and the population attributable fraction. But we're doing it under an important assumption, the assumption of non-interference, that each of, our, each of us is mutually exclusive, that we contribute mutual independence to the data. And we can start generating models with first order transmission, sort of these first order events, and that starts kind of challenging the assumption of non-interference, but it still doesn't get us to onward transmission. So interference in the context of a network or onward transmission, we can only really do with our transmission dynamics models, with our systems that allow us to capture these networks, whether deterministically or otherwise. And what's really cool about this is because, again, coming back to what we want to do in epidemiology is get that counterfactual, but we have challenges doing it in the context of most of our observational studies. But if we put the two together, if we take our epidemiological work and we take our ability to mechanistically tease out what we think is at play, we can take that population attributable fraction and we can actually do what it was always meant to reflect, the what if. So what if a given risk factor was taken away? What if that given risk factor was actually modified? And what if that risk factor actually led to transmission events? We can simulate out our base case scenario. We can create what if experiments with our modeling. And we can look at what that difference would have been. And what's really neat about this is that it ends up not being a static estimate. If our risk factor led to disproportionate risk of transmission, you could imagine into it that it would in fact therefore lead to a attributable fraction that would grow over time. And so I'm going to use that work around transmission population attributable fraction over time, because there's always a time element to it, and talk about something that's happened over the last 20 years in the HIV um, epidemiology field. We're going to challenge the fallacy of the generalized epidemic. So across the globe, there's 38 million people currently living with HIV. The highest burden of HIV is in countries across Eastern and Southern Africa. So the highest HIV prevalence, again, in Southern and Eastern Africa with respect to the countries. And what's happened is when we've, over the last 20, and actually, in fact, even longer than that, 30 years, high HIV prevalence, high burden regions have been classified as having generalized epidemics. When a third of the population is living with HIV, we sort of start forgetting about, and we did for many years, decades, key affected populations who within that one third of the population living with HIV, have themselves experienced even higher disproportionate risks. Key populations, individuals engaged in formal sex work, men who have sex with men, people who inject drugs, particularly given the socio-political and criminalization climate in many countries, small subset of the population experiencing five to 20 times the HIV burden of the wider population. And these risks, largely shaped by network and structural level factors. And even now, as our HIV prevalence in many countries starts declining, we're still seeing higher, disproportionately higher HIV prevalence in some key populations. And this uh, data is showing in particular for female sex workers in uh, three countries in uh, Southern Africa. So what did we do? Part of HIV epidemiology for decades has been an attempt to characterize and classify HIV epidemics. So we started by calling epidemics kind of as we normally would. We would say, hey, it's a growing epidemic. It's kind of now mature. We use that word mature for decades. And then said, okay, now it's starting to decline. And that's sort of how we simulated it out. That's how we characterized the epidemics. And we moved sort of somewhere around the early 2000s into using some numbers and, and they didn't really come from anywhere but we started saying that well if hiv prevalence in a given setting a district a country is more than one percent it's generalized and so it's sort of beyond key affected populations it's no longer concentrated in the context of disproportionate risk 
we essentially kind of did away with the idea of disproportionate risk and said now it's sort of everywhere. This homogenization of our characterizing of that epidemic. We said, well, that wasn't really working well for us. And then a couple of years later, we started thinking, okay, we don't want to just use these numbers 1% below or above as a threshold to classify generalized epidemics. We want to take a look at that distribution, that, that measure of inequality. And so we use different types of models, the most common one being the modes of transmission model. It was a cohort model that tried to stratify subsets of the population, including key populations, and said, you know, who is acquiring the most infections? Of the next 1,000 HIV infections, how are they sort of distributed across the subset of the population? But then we did some work that said, well, is that the right metric to use when we're talking about heterogeneity, when we're talking about inequities? Because when we place that into the context of looking at onward transmission, what these measures of acquisition, or even that short-term transmission, that direct transmission, all of them in the context of settings, conditions that lead to disproportionate risk. So for example, those experienced by key populations, these will underestimate the transmission population attributable fraction, especially over time. And so what this told us is that essentially, it wasn't the models that we were using. It was the information we were gleaning from the models. It was a metric that we chose to prioritize that would underestimate the role of vulnerabilities faced by key populations in sustaining HIV transmission. And this was important because it also led to the dis distribution of resources. So when we think of the population attributable fraction in epidemiology, when we bring it forward in thinking about it in the epidemiology of infectious diseases, we're really now starting to get more and more interested, not in distribution of acquisition, it is important, but in distribution of onward transmission. Who is at risk of onward transmission? And even more importantly, under what conditions are they at risk of onward transmission? And given the language that could lead to both stigma and targeting of populations, when we sort of think about this idea of sort of one thing is attributable to another, for example. We started discussing it in context of prevention gaps and the unmet needs of key populations, rather than thinking that something is attributable to one thing or another. And so really what we're doing with our transmission models now is we're really trying to answer questions about the extent to which ongoing risks faced by key populations might sustain HIV spread and we're thinking about epidemic drivers along this idea of the causal pathway. What are the factors, be they structural, behavioral, biological, or interactions between them, whose presence is necessary and sufficient to sustain HIV transmission? To those of us who work in epidemic modeling, you'll recognize this would be the definition of, for example, the reproductive number. Such that if these are not addressed, it would undermine all other efforts at local epidemic control. And while we apply this in the context of HIV, it would apply to any other infectious disease. And it has important programmatic impact. So we've shown that if, as again, one would intuit, this came as no surprise as we were doing the work, but it um, had resonance with respect to policy impact, is if we're if we're able to figure out what are those mechanisms, what are those inequities, and to what extent they drive onward transmission, then we're going to get a larger, longer term impact. Longer term being the key word here. Versus if we just look at distribution of acquisition and allocate resources accordingly. And in fact, sometimes when you just allocate according to acquisition, we might actually do worse than just doing random allocation uh, themselves. And so when you, you'll hear terms such as applying a more specific response by knowing what inequities under, underpin onward, disproportionate onward transmission, we can design more specific responses. We achieve a larger impact potentially for the same resources. And so now there's been a lot of work, several mathematical models across our team collaborators that have started looking in the context of these so-called generalized epidemics where for decades, we homogenized to try to, with the best available data, 
estimate with transmission modeling the unmet prevention and treatment needs in the context of HIV of men who have sex with men, which here shown for two different regions in Senegal and in Cameroon, and in the context of sex work and clients, here shown for South Africa and three countries in Southern Africa. And what we're seeing is large proportion of onward transmission in the context of vulnerabilities faced by a small subset of the population, even in high prevalence generalized epidemics. And so when we can think about this, if you kind of divide them up, that we're talking about disproportionate onward transmission in the context of vulnerabilities faced by a small subset of the population, to some extent tells you about the efficiency of onward transmission from failing to address specific inequities that persist. And this is all in the context of thinking about key populations and sort of underlying elements of disproportionate risk and transmission. Well, what about our interventions? Many times we have made an assumption that when we try to achieve a given reach or coverage of an intervention, here shown in the context of Southern Africa for HIV epidemics, that we wanted to reach 90, 90, 90. Many of you may have heard of this. It's a goal set by UNAIDS. It's hoped that by getting 90% of people living with HIV diagnosed, of whom 90% on antiretroviral treatment to suppress the virus, and of whom 90% would have suppressed their virus. If we could achieve that by 2020, then we would have been in a really good place. We didn't fully achieve that. And more importantly, even in places where we did achieve it, in the overall population, there are subsets of the population where that's not what we achieved. That's not what programs were able to achieve. And so if you assume that actually that 90, 90, 90, that coverage was equal across subsets of the population, you get a very different result from what we might expect than if we leave a subset of the population behind. And this is important because as modelers, we often, if, especially when we don't have data that are stratified on how well our interventions are reaching subsets of the population, we are at risk of underestimating the impact of most of our programs. So the story of HIV that I wanted to talk about was looking back at the last few decades, were, perhaps even are, our models amplifying health inequities in HIV epidemics? Well, if we remove ourselves from the ivory tower and we think that our models are actually helping inform programs and policies and services, then I think we have to take a deep, hard look at ourselves and think about whether our conceptualization of generalized HIV epidemics and using metrics for measuring inequalities that we knew, and we're not hard to determine, underestimated the influence of mechanisms that confer inequities, did we contribute to persistence in terms of um, uh, programmatic, um, uh, uh, undermining programs that would reduce inequities? And therefore, conversely, if we now have an opportunity to tease apart the distribution of onward transmission, to examine the impact of inequities and the impact of programs in reducing inequities, could therefore we actually play an active role um, in, in, in confronting inequities? And then second part, should we challenge ourselves at any point when we are modeling an epidemic and we take the time to stratify the population at risk, question our assumptions about intervention access and reach, and ideally with data? The second story I'm going to tell is around COVID and the fallacy of trickle-down public health in parallel to this idea of the generalized epidemic. So these were the data. They were very clear from the beginning of the pandemic onwards that if we take a look at distribution of cases, there was inequality. Here shown for the city of Toronto, about 20, early in the pandemic, about 25% of the population accounted for 63% of cases. This was in the first wave. And this was true across cities. So we looked at this across several cities in Canada, and that's kind of the general pattern we were observing. If you sort of take a look, 50% of cases and 25% of the population. And it, it was different in different cities. So when we took a look at sort of how social determinants of health um, were sort of 
In this case, looking at area level measures of the proportion of the population that was working in essential services could not work remotely. There was a different distribution across cities and how COVID cases also concentrated were somewhat different across cities. So it wasn't that one social determinant would necessarily translate to the same issue in, in a different city. And early in the pandemic, area level social and structural inequalities, they did determine or they were associated with COVID related mortality, even after, oh, I have a question. Shall I take one now? Sure. For, for Guinea, the people would be uh, sorted according to wealth. What is it sorted by here in the vertical axis? Okay, so great point. So instead of sorting across wealth, we sorted areas. In this case, we don't have individual level social determinants. So we had sort of um, measures of geographic area called the dissemination area. And so what we were able to do is take a look and see, could we sort them across? variables like household income. So it wouldn't be individual income, but it would be household income. Or um, the extent to which that neighborhood had um, what proportion were essential workers or what proportion were racialized. So we sorted according to that. And what's interesting is um, it's starting to be used more now as a metric for trying to monitor inequalities in, in COVID epidemics, sort of in the US and a few other places now as well. But even before COVID, it was not commonly yet, but more often used um, beyond sort of looking at income, exactly. But yes, absolutely borrowing from um, uh, um, um, the economists who study this for inequalities. Yes. So Montreal, big, three big cities, Vancouver and Toronto are about the same. Montreal is quite low in comparison. Do you have any comment on that? Um, so I, I, uh, we did this as a multi-province uh, study, so um, our Montreal colleagues could better speak to this. But where we saw similarities were in certain social determinants, particularly proportional racial, racialized communities. So we saw that as sort of a unifying theme across our different cities. Whereas in some cities, as you're right, we didn't see the same concentration with respect to, for example, proportion essential workers. And there's two sort of reasons for that. One is it depended on whether or not that particular social determinant was really concentrated geographically within the city or not. So that's one, it's because if you don't have a lot of heterogeneity across your geographies, we're not gonna see the pattern. And the second is it may not have played as large a role as other social determinants in, in comparing across cities. So the, both of them together. Yeah. But it sort of to us spoke to the importance of looking at not just one particular province, we're starting to dig down more into the micro level into the cities themselves. And it also showed the importance of not necessarily just saying if something occurs one place, that the context would be exactly the same in another, uh, another place. Okay. And so, of course, a lot of the work we did before that was descriptive, that sort of just showed us the um, distribution, showed us the pattern it didn't necessarily deal with potential confounders. And so when we looked at this with respect to overall mortality, what we saw was in fact, those area level social determinants that you saw before, even after we adjusted for age, sex, clinical factors, we were still seeing higher levels of mortality. And this really spoke to the importance of the exposure risks that were still taking place. And in fact, in the context, and this is shown for Ontario, COVID-19 reversed the pattern of mortality in the context of recent immigration and among racialized communities. So we have the opposite pattern um, pre-pandemic. Okay. So if observed inequalities were a signal, again, remember all we've seen so far is inequalities. We haven't really dug down to inequities. Were our interventions designed to address inequities. So this is where I wanted to just ask a few questions among, of, of ourselves. So there was a systematic review done quite early in the pandemic that looked at all the public health measures. And this was uh, across Canada. And they said, okay, how many of those public health measures, sort of closures of given um, spaces, um, restrictions around uh, um, um, uh, coming together, how many of them were tailored 
to social determinants. They never really used the word equity. It was important to note that this is talking about tailored to specific social determinants. And so, and they found that about a third were. So about a third were closures of places like religious congregation areas, for example. And they considered that and they framed this as tailored. So I'd like to ask us about those things. If a public health measure is to reduce contacts is tailored, to what extent is it an equity informed strategy? There's a really interesting paper that started conceptualizing, or sorry, talked about conceptualizing this. So if we have two cases, if we have individuals who in general have fewer cumulative contacts, they live in smaller households, they work, they could work remotely or they work in places where it's easier to sort of physically distance. And then we've got case B where we've got individuals who they may have tighter social networks, they may live in more uh, crowded settings and their cumulative contacts are greater. And what we're saying here is that when we did public health measures that were tailored, we were trying to reduce contacts only in some settings. So we take a really simple mathematical model and we say, okay, we've got two subsets of population similar to case A and case B. We've got living housing context and contacts within there. We've got workplace contacts within there. And then we've got these non-essential spaces and that's what we're trying to say, hey, you know, this is where we wanna reduce our contacts. This is what we can close down. And we know that the living and housing, they're correlated. We know that from data at the area level, we know it from the individual level. And we say, okay, well, if we've got these two groups and then we go ahead and what we do is we actually reduce contacts only in the context of non-essential spaces. What does that actually do? Because if group one comprise essential workers and they're not able to work remotely and they're correlated with living in larger households and in those larger households, they're correlated with more household members who are also essential workers. In comparison to group two who can work remotely, smaller households and fewer households with other essential workers. What does that mean? When we close those non-essential spaces that we decided were going to be tailored, such as for example, um, religious uh, um, or cultural um, settings, we were gonna see fewer infection in both groups, yes. A larger relative impact in group two. And sometimes we end up getting increased inequality after the in intervention. So it begs the question, even though we tried to be tailored, were we actually addressing inequities? And in this case, the slide above would suggest that if most of transmission is occurring in the context of the household, in the context of household crowding, or in the context of workspaces without adequate workplace safety measures, for example, if that's actually what's leading to the mechanism in terms of modifiable preventable inequity, then our intervention was not actually a directly equity informed intervention. And this plays out in a really important assumption that was made by several of us throughout the pandemic. This assumption that applying strategies to reduce transmission amongst all of us, including those of us who experience less risks, would also benefit those at disproportionately higher risk. And so oftentimes we heard throughout the pandemic that uh, this measure is equity, is baked in equity, or the reason we're doing this is because of equity. And it was interesting to hear sort of multiple sides sort of use that same framing and same logic without necessarily explaining that logic. So let's take a look. Again, with a very simple mathematical model, we can take two groups, two strata. They have a weighted average number of contacts of about 12 per day. One subset of the population, 25% of the population has a lot more contacts than the other subset of the population. We can consider this sort of lower risk, higher risk, and we can think about any kind of um, uh, um, mechanisms that would lead to that, but here just simply contacts. And of course, we can talk about how the contacts come together and mixing, but we'll leave that for now. And what we do is we apply a 25% reduction in contact rates, and we assume that all individuals can feasibly do this. So this is our equal intervention. What we see in our higher risk contexts, for example, in lower income neighborhoods, we get a large impact. We also get a large impact 
in the higher income neighborhoods or our low risk group. We're starting at two different places and we see quite a big impact. But what if when we apply that 25% reduction in contact rates, we're actually not able to feasibly do that with everybody? What if there's a subset of the population that is at higher risk, that is also at lower probability of being able to actually materialize that intervention? So what if they can't reduce their contact rates as much, for example, in the context of essential workers, while everyone else does at 25%? What we see is a difference. We see that black dotted line show up over there. We undermine the impact of that potential intervention. We don't really undermine it. We just underestimate it. But importantly, we don't see that difference occur just in our higher risk context, in our lower income neighborhood. We also see that we're starting to get more infections in our higher income neighborhoods. Because remember, everyone's connected. And so we see the spillover from what we call the prevention gap. And so this overall reduction occurs with our intervention with, equal, with an equal intervention, um, uh, um, uh, sorry, this is, this is our unequal intervention. So this is when interventions don't necessarily reach our higher risk subset of the population. We increase inequality. And what we've done is we've amplified the downstream influence of the underlying inequities because we haven't actually addressed things that actually have put the smaller subset of the population at higher risk at higher risk. And so what we see is that if we, even though we've dampened the epidemic overall, we've actually increased inequality. And even when we had equal reach, when we had 25% reduction in contacts across both groups, we still see an increase in inequality. Even though, again, we've dampened infections across both groups, we've widened the gap. And again, we've therefore amplified the downstream influence of the underlying inequities. And just as we thought about in the context of HIV, we think of this as prevention gaps. What are the prevention gaps that stem from an intervention that cannot have equal reach, and in fact, should actually have disproportionately more reach in those who are at higher risk? So our assumption, and I call this trickle-down public health, because although strategies to reduce transmission among those who experience less risks, yes, they do benefit those disproportionately experiencing higher onward transmission risks, they may also further concentrate epidemics and increase the influence of inequities in transmission risks. And so we have to ask ourselves, what are we trying to do with our interventions? Dampen overall, or do we also want to narrow the gap? So if we take a look at the data and we look over the last, the whole pandemic, most, and this paper was, uh, it stopped at wave five. Uh, we can look at the Lorenz curve and, and credit to Dr. Adrian Chan who, who titled this, among whom did we flatten the curve? So if we take a look at hospitalizations and deaths, this is data for Ontario, and we look at the magnitude of inequality, it hasn't budged across our five waves. And we've now done this up to now seven waves, and it still hasn't budged. And this is despite reaching, to some extent, some equal level with respect to combination of vaccination coverage and hybrid immunity. So we actually had reasonable vaccination for wave two that actually got us to um, reasonable equal. We start seeing inequality again in vaccination coverage with dose three and four at least for first and second dose, and if we also add in elements of hybrid immunity, it doesn't look like vaccination or infection-induced immunity together are enough to explain the pattern we saw on the previous slide. And unlike data from Italy and the US, which showed when we took a look at mobility and um, using proxies like cell phone data by income, where it looked like actually lower income were able to less likely sort of shelter in place or therefore had more movement. It was a bit of a different pattern in Ontario where we actually saw lower income neighborhoods were able to cell phones necessarily, not necessarily individuals, decrease metrics of mobility, decrease mobility almost as much as higher income. And this, we only have data for this for the first two waves. So it doesn't look like that 
is enough to also explain the patterns that we still continue to see. And so this is just showing the cumulative deaths, the pattern up to now wave seven. And so it really begs the question, we, have, we had all these interventions in place, what residual disproportionate risks must still have been at play in order for it to, us to still keep seeing these patterns of inequality that we're seeing now. And so that's the kind of work we're trying to tackle now, the multi-pronged approach to try to figure out and tease apart the attributable fraction of different inequities and how much our interventions impacted them. So are our models, were our models, amplifying health inequities in COVID epidemics? Once again, I would argue that it's not our models, but it's the assumptions we make as modelers about intervention access, intervention reach. And I would say it is our misconceptualization of mechanisms in, in epidemics and what we classify and use slogans as in, about addressing inequities that actually perpetuate the myth of trickle down public health. And that it's not our models, it's us. So one of the things that and as I said, I'm not a social scientist, but when I collaborate with social scientists, one of, one of the powerful things I've learned is around the standard practice in qualitative research of reflexivity. And thinking hard about, am I interpreting the data? Am I interpreting the results in a certain way because of my life experiences and because of my perspective? Because as a modeler, I and my colleagues together have conceptualized the model. We've abstracted what we think are the key processes. And then we've interpreted and communicated the findings. And so to some extent, if I haven't actually placed my work in the context of people lived with lived experience and who are living through what I'm working on and the further I am from the populations that are being modeled in my models, to what extent am I starting to misinterpret um, misconceptualize and misattribute what I think are inequities. And so therefore, I would like to argue that our models themselves may be these objective pieces, but models themselves are not agnostic because we have placed our perspectives when framing and designing them. And so in summary, epidemic models, they by definition are mechanistic, they're causal. And they, because we are not agnostic, and conceptualizing heterogeneity in epidemic models within causal frameworks of health equity is an important way forward. And again, I credit my team, Hu Ting Ma, Lin Wei Wang, and others who have really kind of pushed us to think about this. And that we, as modelers, particularly now that we've gone from our ivory tower and papers that within our communities we may read to now public health actors who are using this, to communities who are reading this and thinking about how this applies to themselves, their programs, advocacy, we have an opportunity to do harm. We also have an opportunity to do better. And then I think the future of epidemic modeling, as somebody who models and works in the field of heterogeneity, I think where we're headed is to integrate epidemic modeling in the scholarly and research ecosystem of health equity with deep collaborations across disciplines community engagement and partnership, and by perhaps starting to standardize our practice around accountability and reflexivity as modelers in public health. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mishra. Uh, Dr. Mishra, my question is actually um, the one of the very first slides in your talk, where uh, you commented on mass models uh, equal to mechanisms. If you can show it, it was about 12 minutes after the beginning of your lecture. Okay, I will try. <laughs> You're testing my. Uh... <laughs> Yes, I see it. Okay. Let's see if that's coming up. Oh, maybe do I need to go back this way? Huh. 
I have messed up the system, but I will try to find it. As you ask your question, we'll do this simultaneously. So, uh, it's about actually uh, unpredictable uh, you have uh, proportion of impact of individuals versus time. So, in some cases, actually, uh, the most uh, good field which look like don't have the uh, normal figure, but then uh, the uh, cute curves are different color, which resemble uh, different yet on exponential distributions with different means. Uh, were they related to different subpopulations? No, so I, I'm. Or were they uh, pieces of uh, normal curves shifted to the left? So or because then if it's really a switch from normal figure to exponential figure, so it's a certain statistical observation, but there ought to be a reason behind such a switch, which we often call phase transition or a critical phenomena, etc. Exactly. So I apologize that I can't seem to bring it up again from here. Um, it's, uh, it, it's kind of rejecting my, my attempts at that. But um, huh. no. I'm having a systems fail. But in, in, in answer to your question, that figure was a very simple SIR system of coupled differential equations. It was just ordinary couple differential equations. And the phase transition that you're describing is exactly right. So you just reduce the contact rates enough that we start getting R0, for example, below 1. So it was just a demonstration of if we change contact rates at a given particular time so, in the uh, course of infection. So would there be a critical kind of exactly. for the phase transition when we switch from normal to exponential behavior? So there should be a critical phase trans, um, transformation. There ought to be a critical number. Exactly. And that the phase transition. Did you estimate it? Not for this. It was just a simple, um, mm -hmm. it was an example to show that this is what we mean by mechanistic models. So not a particular study in itself. But what you're touching upon is really important. This idea that when we think about disproportionate risk, what we're actually talking about is um, concentrating transmission in a way in which the R0 starts going up. So you actually do end up changing the reproductive rate when you have more and more heterogeneity in your model. If that makes sense. It does. Yeah. And uh, also, failing uh, at this. Yeah. And it's actually just a comment. Uh, I, I, I used to teach biostatistics, but in Western Canada. Now I teach at uh, UTS Canberra. And uh, just a comment uh, that uh, we always tell our students, even those who take biostats, not to confuse uh, mutually exclusive. With independence. Thank you. You yeah. actually kind of, uh, you actually sound it like uh, referring to mutual exclusiveness and independence. I apologize. Yeah. To keep them separate. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your interest. Thank you. Any more questions? Yes. Um, I'm sorry, this is going to be a little bit of a dumb question from a social scientist to understand just a little bit, but, <laughs> uh, but uh, one of the things that strikes me a lot about this very fantastic work that you're doing and your colleagues as well is uh, the fact that a lot, of, a lot of it does not go into the mainstream media and, and this really um, it frustrates me a lot because I wish uh, people saw it. So I'm wondering, like when you were saying, oh, there's uh, like, we, we can do a lot of harm, but we can also do better. Is there in uh, the future uh, collaborations are also like possibility of lobbying or possibility of like improving uh, uh, media coverage uh, or like doing those fancy visualizations that uh, people love so much and loved uh, so much during the pandemic that totally misled us and so on and so forth. Uh, th thank you. Um, so, I mean, there's uh, the nice thing about thinking about collaboration with, with multiple disciplines is thinking about people who work in the space of 
knowledge mobilization and knowledge translation and who would do a much better job of that um, than, uh, than I think sometimes as, as scientists at times, um, because we start kind of going down the rabbit hole of nuance and, and start losing sort of the, um, what, what can be sort of the punchy line that, that comes out. But, but certainly I think what was very evident is that, you know, a lot of our reports that go to um, government officials that go to, you know, pandemic reports, even the SARS commission from 2003 sort of, talk about equity and, and, you know, Public Health Agency of Canada put out a report around social determinants and, 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 um, um, and thinking about sort of equity. But what has challenged sort of that um, transformation from the science into actual um, decisions and policies, there's a lot of levers that are at play that, that I think is, um, yeah, that, that take scientists I feel like with, with skills that I don't have and, and that others have a lot better with that, that we can collaborate with. Where I think we sort of played a role though is in trying to almost oversimplify the message. So um, as, as modelers, I think we contributed to that. Um, and, and part of that is because perhaps we didn't want our work to be so black box, um, but also, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I would say like I found myself in that in that space of um, feeling uh, like you're kind of talking about this element of heterogeneity. Oh, but, you know, sort of, oh, but we need to do something else. And one of the barriers really is the importance we place on dampening overall versus um, narrowing the gap. And in part because we make it a versus. We say it's sort of one or the other. And in part because of our framing that one is a trade off with the other, um, I think we've somewhat contributed to that. But yes, I think a lot of work to do along people are very talented at sort of uh, speaking to media um, and, and speaking to, to public health decision makers. And, and great data visualization, yes, around equity would be very welcome. Thank you. So I see a couple of questions in the chat. Oh, yeah. The first one was from Colin Ramsey. Uh, it's the chat sort of disappearing from my screen, so I can't see the whole thing. I'm going to try to bring but it up here too. The question I think was about, uh, could you say something about the difference in uh, COVID or is there a difference in the COVID mortality rates for different populations, which are, are, are they related to the different morbidity rates? Oh, so, so great question. Um, the work that I showed, um, uh, was led by a team member um, uh, um, on our team, Lin Wei Wang. So the analysis we did, in fact, so we do see differences in mortality, absolutely, at a population level with respect to comorbidities. But in our analyses, these were dealt as confounders. And so even after adjusting for that, in fact, they didn't play a role in explaining the variability we were seeing by social determinants. Um, so to what extent is a difference and so it didn't play much of a role at all yeah. so we saw the same pa similar pattern and magnitude yeah okay thank you and then there's another question if yeah. you're seeing this this is better um could you touch on using different measures to define disparities for example rate ratio versus rate difference uh and how to balance being thoughtful about metric choices that might identify health disparities versus issues with researcher degree of freedom okay um, yeah, so I mean, there's a lot, there's still a lot of debate and discussion, particularly in the world of, you know, social epidemiology um, and, and health equity around what measures make sense. And, and often it does come down to um, what, what, what question are we trying to answer in particular? And so probably best practice is to report them all and to sort of discuss the implications of each. Um, but but you, there's, no, there's no standard as to which one is the best. What I would probably argue is that when we make choices about one and not the other, that's probably when we're ascribing some degree of value to what we want to uh, share and, and, and present. So um, I, think, uh, I think it's being transparent about to what extent um, each one matters more than the other. So for example, it, if something changes, as you said, like as a, at a relative versus like the baseline still stays really high, you know, uh, what does that mean for our program? So I, I would I would argue that we should report them all out, and that we should decide which is our primary one of interest based on our research question. Thank 
and not be selective about it. Yeah. Is there a follow up there? Is there a follow -up? So I guess I'm still answering your question around, it, it, it does still leave some degree of research, yeah, degree of freedom for the researcher. The one thing I would probably say is, again, I wanna just come back to the fact that like, when we're talking about inequities, I think we have to be very, um, not I think, the field suggests this, that we need to define what our theory is. We need to think about what our conceptual framework is. We need to articulate our causal pathways a priori. And I think if we do that, we protect ourselves from trying to, um, you know, pick and choose what measure of inequality or what we ascribe to inequity. Are there any further questions? Well, let's uh, thank Dr. Mishra Graham for her really interesting talk. Thank you. Oh, I missed the one comment. Yeah. Repeat the audience questions. Oops. <laughs> oh. Great. Thank you. Yeah. This what actually uh, wrote during the talk. This was actually the name of the slide. I'll give it to you. This was the comment. Oh, okay. Yeah, so yeah. You have this because this is an interesting thing. Yeah, it, it was just that, like every SIR system kind of, yeah. 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 Yeah, and I think I feel like um, the, the textbooks certainly have, but I was using it as an example. Yeah. No, no, I appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Hi.